Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here at the John Hope Franklin Center. We're joined by Al Sara of Al Sara and the Nubatones. Yeah. How are you doing this morning? I'm great, and you? I'm great also. So you're here in residence at Duke University, yes. um, performing and meeting with student groups and sitting here with me mm -hmm. at Left to Black. Uh, <laughs> um, it is so great to have you. You've been described and use some of this, use some of this language yourself as East African retro pop. Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean by that? Um, it's actually a really simple definition. To me, it's, um, my, my music has always kind of, uh, it's not particularly traditional music, it's mm -hmm. pop, but it's not necessarily modern pop. It always draws from an older era of pop. So for me, it's retro pop. And mm -hmm. I draw from the sounds of East Africa, from Zanzibari Tarabu to Nubian and Sudanese music. And so for me, I've always felt like as a part of a more holistic region than as opposed to just one section of it. So for me, it made sense that I would be East African retro pop because the terms that I was offered as an alternative didn't make sense. I mean, because you know, here in the United States, uh, they, they'd love to define things and mm. put it into categories and often without any attention to specificity. Absolutely. So I'm sure there are folks who would be much more comfortable describing your music as world music oh, yeah. or African music, but you're kind of pushing back here, mm -hmm. right? You're arguing for a level of specificity, demanding that folks kind of deal with where this music is coming from and, and who you're trying to speak to. Absolutely. I think it does not do a service to anybody, either the audience or the artist, for us to continue to just co-sign vagueness, continue mm -hmm. to co-sign mm -hmm. what, like, well, basically, whitewashing over the way we consume sound. Mm -hmm. The way we spend so much energy in the nuances of Western music and its genres and subgenres and sub subgenres should be given to all art forms across the whole continent, in Africa and out of Africa. Mm -hmm. So for me it's really about it's really about take, making a point of defining myself, telling people who I am as opposed to letting them tell me who I am. You were born in the Sudan, mm -hmm. um, but you've also lived in the United States, mm -hmm. grew up in New England, mm -hmm. um, went to Wesleyan University. Yeah. Um, talk about what your experiences were different in terms of where you grew up and, and then settling here in the U.S. Well, you know, the biggest difference is like I was a city kid, and when we moved to <laughs> when we moved to Western Massachusetts, we moved next to a farm. <laughs> I was horrified, to be really frank. <laughs> I had not had that many close encounters with cows, and it was, <laughs> and so <laughs> that was a really big cultural shock, which people I think don't realize. I was like, I was born in a big, in the biggest city in Sudan, right, right, and from right. there I moved to another big city in right. Yemen, and from there we moved to a really tiny village with a bunch of, you know, with a bunch of universities. It it had a similar vibe actually to Durham right, in terms right, of like. Right. You know, a lot of universities around, but a small local population. Yeah, fairly, yeah. fairly liberal and diverse for the size and the location. Yeah, I hear that. But still, a small town yeah. in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and you go to Wesleyan and you study ethnomusicology. Yeah. How important it was that to the kind of work that you're doing now as a musician? You know, I think it gave me the tools I needed to be able to have the kinds of conversations in the kind of way I needed to have them in order to be able to assert myself. Because while I knew at the end of my years at Wesleyan that I didn't want to be an ethnomusicologist, I really also understood the gaze mm -hmm. of the Western gaze on mm -hmm. me and how it would be for me if I decided to make music not in English, mm -hmm. which I already knew at that point that I didn't want to sing in English. Um, I might change my mind at some point down the line, but at, the, at that moment I didn't want to. So I, graduating from that, I'm really glad I had those tools because I understood what people were saying to me mm. in a diff on another level too, gotcha, you know? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, so I'm grateful for that, always will be. You are very clear about your Nubian heritage. Mm -hmm. And for many folks in the United States, the only Nubians that they know show up in uh, the Ten Commandments <laughs> in the early part of the film. Um, but you're very clear about that in terms of your own identity and also the challenge of not being raised using Nubian language mm. and speaking in Arabic and trying to find some way to reclaim that language even as you're trying to produce it in the context of the music. Yeah, absolutely. I think 
One of the main privileges that I have, I, I feel, of being in the diaspora is having a bird's eye view of my culture as well. You know, being mm -hmm. outside, mm -hmm. being an outsider when you're also an insider, is a, it gives you a certain advantage. And that's to really look at yourself and assess yourself. And, and it made me really aware of the presence of Arabic on the eastern coast of Africa, also as a colonizing force. And that's something we don't really talk Come about out, often right, enough. Right. You know, because the, 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 the history of the Islamic empires is really long and strong and started and was also a colonizing force. Right. It was just an older one right. than the ones we think of today. And so for me, really redefining that and coming in to look at it was really important for me and really assessing my whole history holistically. Mm -hmm. um, and music is one of the best ways in which you can connect back with stories. Yeah. Um, so for me, music was the way I went back to it. Um, after the success of the first album, Silt, in 2014, mm. um, you tragically lose a band member. Mm. Um, and, and so the group has to literally regroup. You spend some time in Morocco. Mm. You also spend some time in a refugee camp mm -hmm. um, working on the documentary. Talk about that experience, um, you know, looking at displaced Sudanese around the country, spending time with them, hearing their stories learning one of their songs. Mm -hmm. um, talk about what that experience was and what kind of impression it made on your music. That was, to me, one of the most life-defining experiences that I had. Um, it also, to me, was a really healing experience as a Sunnis person. Mm -hmm. um, I felt, my whole life, I felt a lot of tension between my relation, in my relationship to Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, there is you know, it, at the same time, it's, it's filled with longing and nostalgia, but it's filled with resentment mm -hmm. and, and feelings of rejection. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something I wanted to be honest with myself about. And that rejection a lot of times had to do with the fact that I was told I wasn't Sudanese enough or I wasn't mm -hmm. Sudanese in the right way, you know? And going out into the camp with Hajjoj Kukka, the filmmaker, to work mm -hmm. on Beats of the Antonov, collecting music, talking to people, and realizing that all these Sudanese people born and raised in Sudan, displaced inside of Sudan itself, mm -hmm. were all being told they weren't Sudanese enough. You know, we were all in the same boat of somehow not being Sudanese enough because we don't fit into the Muslim Arab centered mm -hmm. paradigm. Yeah. Right. Um, even though they're all Muslims actually. Right. Um, they just have other languages as well as Arabic. And so it's, it made it so, so painfully clear just what was happening in terms of this real white like real Arab washing of the nation yeah. and how it's happening through education through um, through government pro pro government propaganda through literally straight-up warfare yeah. Yeah. Um, and for me to feel that and see that and know that all my people were all suffering from this together really just removed my concept of Sudan outside of Khartoum you know mm -hmm. what I mean mm -hmm. we have this thing that where we just centered it there and I started to look outside of it and that made me feel so much more connected and makes me feel more connected with the rest of East Africa, you know, with Kenya. I have so many Sudanese living there now and in Uganda and in Ethiopia. And so you just, you started to just look at it in a different way. And then seeing that, and you know, and Nubia is between Sudan and Egypt. And so mm -hmm. the border crisis, really like mm -hmm. the idea of borders divided the nation mm -hmm. in half. Right, right, and right. so for me, these, it just, it just made it highlighted the, the, the problematic nature of borders and just how imaginary they are. Mm. So that was, that was an important, important experience for me. You have a great line that you use in an interview with Fader when you say that, you know, you are a, a generation of Sudanese diaspora. Mm. Um, and I thought that was such an interesting phrasing of it, right? You know, placing yourself within this generation, uh, that a generational mode of being displaced, mm -hmm. right? That that, in fact, is what your identity is. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that idea. Um, you know, for me, it's, I, I am, once you, once you leave home, mm -hmm. you begin a whole different journey. And for Sudanese people, our, my, our mass migration did not start until the early 90s which is literally with my generation. So before us, there wasn't a history right. of displacement like right. this at right. all. Right. And now it is literally, there's not a single household in Sudan that doesn't have somebody living in the diaspora hmm. because you need that in order to support the economic system inside. People are not, people are struggling. And so I grew up with this 
as, a, as the norm, a lot of people in my age group grew up in between places. Yeah. Grew up, and not necessarily just in, not in the States, but all over the world. We're all over the place. And it's all, the, it's, there's a commonality, a common denominator to, dis, to being in the diaspora. Because it's, it's, it, you, it, because you're kind of like on a bridge. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You're, and you are in the middle of it, and you can see both sides of it. And so that could be something that tears at you, or you can embrace it as something that gives you a bigger view of yeah. things. How do young Sudanese feel about you and your music? I think I have some, some healthy fans. <laughs> <laughs> I have a healthy fan base. I ha also have a healthy hateration base. Um, and they both communicate with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I know how my haters feel. Thank you for your messages. <laughs> Um, and thank you for continuing to click on my things so ferociously. I appreciate that. It's bringing in that cash. <laughs> you know, it's interesting when we talk about music from the continent here in the United States, um, I think even at this moment now there aren't enough generations, particularly of young African-American folks who know how to hear mm. music from the continent, right? Mm. Unless it's, you know, presented them in some of the most simplistic ways, mm. which means you absolutely, as an artist, need the remix. Yes. <laughs> How important has the remix been? I mean, I think about that Odyssey remix, mm. which I imagine just totally introduced you to a wider audience of, of, of American listeners, mm -hmm. right, in ways that wouldn't have happened before. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. I think in the United States, and um, there is this real, I don't know, it's like this unspoken tension that's only changing now that I noticed as soon as I came here of African Americans trying to separate themselves from the continent while at the same time trying to embrace the continent. And I don't know if that's the tension of growing up in America and America's concept of Africanness. Um, probably a lot of that. But in general, all Americans, America's idea of assimilation of like you leave your culture behind and you become an American mm -hmm. is a part of that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a part of why people feel like they shouldn't listen to things in other languages. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't listen to, well, while at the same time, nobody doesn't know someone that speaks multiple languages. Right. Right. which is a strange oxymoron. Right. Right. And so I felt like a lot of it had to do with just the state of mind and an approach and feeling like maybe we are not the same. To me, I think of myself as a part of the African-American community because right. now I'm an African in the diaspora. Right. And the African-American community is the first African diaspora here. And so that's my guideline for how we work. And there's some irony to this, right? Because you'll have, you know, hip hop artists from Brooklyn that will go to Japan and Japanese don't know anything about these words, mm -hmm. right? But they're just locked into the music and even the language, even if they don't know what the language means. Mm -hmm. um, and it's as if, you know, as you just suggested, we're not encouraged in our schools and otherwise here in the United States to think about language and culture outside of the boundaries of the U.S. the same way. Exactly, and, but it's changing now, honestly. I, I see it everywhere I go. And I think that's why there is this right wing pushback against right, it. Right, There's so right. many migrants here. There's so many people, second generation, first generation, third generation, and they know their stories. No matter what the U.S. wants to do, it can never change the fact that this is a land of immigrants. Yeah. You know what I mean? Unless you are a person of the First Nation, you're an immigrant. Right. Just facts. Yeah. Just historical facts. <laughs> and so, for me, that has actually always given me a sense of ownership here too. Yeah. I felt like, no, I could belong here too. This is a place where a lot of people can belong. Mm -hmm. And that was the magic of New York for me. It's like, I feel so at home in New York because it was, Brooklyn was the first place where I felt like I can be from somewhere else oh. and be right. from Brooklyn. Right. You know what I mean? You could right. be all of you at right. the same Just, time right. and right. celebrate it together. Right. And <laughs> that's beautiful. That's an amazing gift to have. Yeah. And I'm hoping that, I mean, I know for a fact that in the next 20 years, the norm is going to be immigrants. Right. Right. The norm is going right. to be people who have experienced a displacement. So I'm just here to let people know that I'm the future normal. <laughs> <laughs> you are a working musician, which means that you're a touring musician. Don't know how many opportunities you get to see movies? I do not get that many. I watch them at home. So you haven't seen Black Panther I yet. haven't seen Black Panther yet, which makes me really sad. I watched all the videos of people watching Black Panther yeah, yeah. because that made my life. That gave me life. Like <laughs> so, so let me ask you this, even if you haven't um, seen the film yet, mm. do you expect to see some aspect of East Africa in Wakanda 
Oh, totally. I mean, yeah. I, I, just because I haven't seen the film does not mean yeah. I have not obsessively <laughs> perused all the photos, <laughs> looking for all the fashion details. You know, there's, there were fashion cues from Kenya, from South Africa, from West Africa. Um, the, there, was fa there was like cultural cues from all over the continent. It yeah. was like a mix, yeah. a mixing pot of African cultures and, and, and diversity um, on a massive pop level though. Um, the Af I think I want to like take a moment and I love the fact that Black Panther has had this large presence, yep. but the Afrofuturistic movement started decades ago mm -hmm. and it's been around for a long time and there's been a lot of people, so you could support that in other ways as well. Um, I am happy that now the presence of Africa is on a mass scale like this mm -hmm. um, and in a fun format like this. Yeah. Um, and in, Im in an imaginary format okay. like this, because it's very much fictional. And, and I like that, but that's, yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna challenge you a bit now. Mm. Um, so you might remember Tower Records. Yes. Um, and they used to have this page in the back called Desert Island Disc. Yes. Yeah, um, so we're gonna borrow from that. Mm -hmm. And you're someplace stranded uh -huh. by yourself and all you got is uh, a music streaming thing that only allows you five albums. What are those five albums that, that you, you're going to live with? For the rest of my life? Yeah. Oh gosh, so yeah. much tension. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you realize this would be literally a moment of crisis for me. I, I got you, I got you. <laughs> okay, five albums, right. full albums. Full albums. Okay, Prince's Musicology. Okay. Full okay. album, because that's okay. a beautiful full album. Um, Okay, ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, <laughs> one of Um Kalsum's songs, because one of her songs is like 45 minutes. <laughs> that works, yeah. So that's kind of an album. Right, it's a bunch right. of movements together. <laughs> um, I would also have, um, it'd be hard to pick one of Abdel Gader Salem's songs, but I would pick one of Abdel Gader Salem's albums, probably Khartoum Blues. Okay. Um, let's see. There's a new album coming out this year that I've already heard, heard. <laughs> <laughs> that I know I'm taking with me to the okay, desert. <laughs> okay, okay. And that's um, an old Sudanese musician named Abu Ubaid Al Hassan, uh -huh. and he played an instrument called the tambour. Yeah. He was a very revolutionary player, though. It's a tr it's a traditional instrument, but he added an extra string to it, okay. sort of really it revamped the sound. The sound. Yeah. He was a brilliant musician, and I would take one of his albums with me. Last album that I would take with me, Bikudu Day from Zanzibar. She has only one album out, so it wouldn't be hard. <laughs> <laughs> but she, she recorded it when she was 89, so I'm, I'm here for every minute of that album. Okay. Started singing when she was 16, recorded wow. it when she was 89, died at 102. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now that, <laughs> everybody look her up. That woman is a force of nature. Uh, I would imagine she was. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I guess those five albums. Although, but then, you know, but then I'm like, there's all these Bessie Smith albums that I would kind of want to take with me. We would have a really hard time with this con. Like, I would, I probably wouldn't leave. <laughs> I'd be like, <laughs> my carton. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe those. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. We've been joined by Alsara of Alsara and the Nuba Tones. Yes. Thank you very much for spending some time with us here at Left of Black. Thank you so much for having me here. Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back